This is Mr. B Sunday School. I am Mr. B, and today we are here to ask ourselves, that means me too, some important questions. How we answer these important questions determine who we are as a person and where we are in our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the first thing we like to do in this class is pray. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Help us to think about who you are and what you've done for us. Bless now the reading of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, I don't know about you, but my least favorite thing to receive, whether by mail or by email, is a survey or a questionnaire. When I was in school, we used to have to fill out questionnaires and surveys all the time, but the teacher called it a test. When I was in grade school, and even into high school, we used to write out our answers in pencil or black or blue ink, and the teacher would respond by writing out her response or his response in red pencil or red ink. Although we didn't like taking tests, we could find out how we were doing in any given subject by taking a test and then waiting until we got our papers back with all the teacher's red ink writings on them. Did you ever have a favorite teacher? Someone who you looked up to? Someone who you felt cared how you were doing? and someone who made it fun to learn. I remember the first time I discovered that my teacher actually cared about what happened to me. Our first question for today is, who is Jesus? Many people call Jesus the teacher both people who love Jesus and people who didn't love Jesus. Both people who trusted Jesus and people who didn't trust Jesus. Our second question is, what is the Bible? Is it simply a collection of writings or is it the inspired Word of God? Can we always trust the Bible? Can we pray and meditate on the Bible and commune with God's Spirit and receive grace, blessing, and instruction? Our third question is, can we learn something simply by reading about it? Or is there some kind of experience we need in order to actually believe it, to know it, and to make it a part of who we are? Jesus is the good teacher. The Bible says that the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught with authority. Our quote today is from Britt Mooney. 
Christian author and contributing writer for Christianity.com. And he says, God is the one person powerful enough to force us against our will to do what is right. And he doesn't. That wouldn't be love. God doesn't want slaves, unwilling slaves. The devil makes slaves and places them in bondage. God wants children, lovers, partners, and friends. The Bible is the most published and the most translated book in history. In Cubbies, I like to teach the little children that the Bible is God's special book and that God can use the Bible when we read it and when we listen to the reading of it. We can trust him to change who we are. Now, as people, we may not like change, and we may not like to change. However, the fact of the matter is, if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be more like the God of the Bible, we need to change. I need to change. We need to change who we are, and I need to change who I am. Change may not be fun, but the result can be a blessing now and for all eternity. Our first reading for today is from Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. We're reading from the New International Version Study Bible. And we're starting at verse 13. Someone was calling out to Jesus. It says here, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. We got a little note here for you. Probs problems like this were often brought to rabbis for them to settle. Jesus' response, though, not Jesus' response, though, is not directly to the topic. It 
It is not a change of subject, though. Jesus is pointing to a higher issue, a correct attitude toward the accumulation of wealth. Life is more than material goods. Far more important is our relationship with God. Jesus put his finger on the question's heart. When we bring problems to God in prayer, he often does the same, showing us how we need to change and grow in our attitude toward the problem. This question is often not the one we were looking for, but it is, or sorry, this answer is not is often not the one we are looking for, but it is more effective in helping us trace God's hand in our lives. Okay. Another question. I like to ask myself this question. Am I being thankful to God for what I have received from him? What can I do today to demonstrate my thankfulness to God. Now, there was an important teacher and probably quite wealthy, certainly a very intelligent and promising student of the Bible. His name was Saul of Tarsus. One day Jesus met Saul of Tarsus as Saul traveled on the road to Damascus. And Saul's life began to change. Instead of persecuting the church of Jesus, the Lord Jesus taught Saul to be a builder of churches and a teacher of the grace of Jesus to all people. Our next reading is from the Challenge Study Bible. That's the contemporary English version. And we're starting at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. My friends, we want you to know that the churches in Macedonia have shown others God's gift of undeserved grace. Although they were going through hard times and were very poor, they were glad to give generously. They gave as much as they could afford and even more, simply because they wanted to. They even asked and begged us to let them have the joy of giving their money for God's people. And they did more than we had hoped they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us, just as God wanted them to do. Titus was the one who got you started doing this good thing. So he begged him to help you finish what you had begun. You do everything better than anyone else. You have a stronger faith. You speak better and know more. You are eager to give and you love us better. Now you must give more generously than anyone else. I am not ordering you to do this. I am simply testing how real your love is by comparing it with the concern that others have shown. You know our Lord Jesus Christ treated us with undeserved grace by giving up all his riches so that you could become rich. A year ago, you were the first ones to give and you gave because you wanted to. So listen to my advice. 
I think you should finish what you started. If you give according to what you have, you will prove you are as eager to give as you were to think about giving. It doesn't matter how much you have, it matter, what matters is how much you are willing to give from what you have. I am not trying to make life easier for others by making life harder for you. But it is only fair for you to share with them when you have so much and they have so little. Later, when they have more than enough and you are in need, they can share with you. Then everyone will have a fair share. Just as the scriptures say, those who gathered too much had nothing left. Those who gathered only a little had all they needed. We have a little note here. It says, they gave themselves first to the Lord. That's the verse it's referring to. Um, a young convert and resident of a rehab program, when the offering basket was passed, was sad that he had absolutely nothing to give. Then he remembered the verse in this chapter. Their first action was to dedicate themselves to the Lord and us. When the offering basket came his way, he prayed and said, Lord, by faith, I place myself in that basket. It's all I can do. Then he felt the Holy Spirit say to him, You've given the best offering anyone could ever give me. When you are blessed financially, remember to give back to the ministry or church that helped you. But never let financial giving take the place of giving yourself to the Lord. All right. We have another reading for you, this time from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're starting at verse 16. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians again. Remember this saying, a few seeds make a small harvest, but a lot of seeds make a big harvest. Each of you must make up your own mind about how much to give, but don't feel sorry that you must give and don't feel you are being forced to give. God loves people who love to give. God can bless you with everything you need, and you will always have more than enough to do all kinds of good things for others. The scriptures say, God freely gives his gifts to the poor, and always does right. God gives seed to farmers and provides everyone with food. He will increase what you have so you can give even more to those in need. You will be blessed in every way and you will be able to keep on being generous. Then, many people will thank God when we deliver your gift. What you are doing is more than a service that supplies God's people with what they need. It is something that will make many others thank God. The way in which you have proved yourselves by this service will bring honor and praise to God. 
You believed the message about Christ, and you obeyed it by sharing generously with God's people and with everyone else. Now, now they are praying for you and want to see you because God used you to bless them so very much. Thank God for his gift that is too wonderful for words. Our little note here says, Giving is like sowing seeds. Plant seeds and watch the harvest come. This giving applies to financial giving or giving time, talent, or other resources to God's work. One must be careful in thinking that a return on giving is only financial. Actually, Paul said the end result of giving is that we will receive back the fruits of righteousness. We should not overemphasize giving in order to receive. Yet it is a biblical principle. One preacher said, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take it from a grouch. That's not scriptural, but it does point out that giving must come from the heart and not from an, an ulterior motive especially if the motive is to get something back, or worse, to draw attention to oneself by giving a substantial gift. Those who are givers receive something back immediately, the joy in giving the gift. All right. We have a little bit of a class roundup for you. When I was in school... I didn't always look forward to reading the teacher's writing that was in red ink. However, even if I had never met my teacher in person, I could always tell which teachers cared about me simply by reading what they had written on my papers. We learned in our last lesson that Jesus is the Logos, the eternal Logos, the true Word of God. We can today reread or meditate on the Word of God. We can memorize verses from the Bible and essentially receive a spiritual hug from Jesus by meditating on God's word. Is that right? From time to time, it is wise to question who we are, what we believe, and especially how we feel. Jesus, the great teacher, cared enough about people to ask questions, as did Saul of Tarsus after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and later began to refer to himself as Paul the Apostle. Jesus cared enough about a young man to answer his question with a question. We're going to take a look at another look at that question, this time in the New Living Translation. We're at Luke chapter 12, verse 14. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? A little sidebar note here for you. Jesus' parable of the rich fool was prompted by a request for Jesus to intervene in a family dispute over inheritance. His response showed that if we are too focused on earthly wealth and treasure, we will miss the point of what is truly valuable. The rich farmer's issue was not be 
a business success in itself as though there were something inherently evil in that. His problem was that his material wealth and success were no substitute for having a rich relationship with God. There are things that even successful people cannot control, and in the final reckoning, he had made a dreadful miscalculation. The parable challenges us to evaluate what really matters. There is more to life than our earthly possessions. The paradox of following Jesus is that it is, e that it is what we give away that makes us truly wealthy and allows us to know that our heavenly investments will not have to be left behind. And in the final reckoning, we'll be waiting for us beyond decay and corruption. Because our hearts will always follow what we really treasure, we need, to chain, we need a change of heart to treasure heavenly things. Once that happens, we will be more open and generous with our earthly possessions. Okay. Paul the Apostle had an important question, or several important questions and teachings for the church at Corinth. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, Paul was dealing at length with giving. We were in, we read that. He uses the example of the Macedonian churches who, despite being poor, had given incredibly generously to the famine-stricken believers in Jerusalem. And Paul urged them to express similar gener the Corinthians to express similar generosity. He shares some principles that should guide Christian giving rooted in how Christ himself has freely given, leaving heaven's riches to give himself. We should therefore give willingly, give eagerly, give generously, for generous sowing leads to generous harvest, give cheerfully. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And give regularly. Regularly. There we go. In his previous letter, Paul had urged them in 1 Corinthians to set aside something on the first day of the week. In other words, regularly, regularly, there we go, and planned. Okay. In the Gospel of John, Jesus of Nazareth is referred to as the Logos, or the complete Word of God. As we travel along the path of life, we can choose to decide or answer the questions, Who is Jesus? Either according to our own feelings and speculations, or according to what the Bible says. We can also choose to answer the question, what is the Bible? Again, according to our own feelings and speculations, or according to what the Bible says. But it is important to keep asking the questions. Are we just reading the Bible, or are we allowing the Bible to change who we are? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. We pray that you bless the reading of your word for each of us this week. Please help us to allow your word to change who we are. 
to make us into what you want us to become. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a great week.